What is the absolute best propeller that you can have on your airplane for stool competitions, for short field performance, for takeoff, for climb, for cruise, for all that stuff? That's what we are going to try to answer in this video with our E-Props, our 76 inch three blade E-Props blade. We got a 82 inch Sense Nick to try out as well, two bladed and our old 70 inch uh, warp drive propeller. How do they hold up to the gravel, the wear and tear in Alaska? How heavy are they? How do they perform? All that good data, as well as cleaning up this insane mess here in this hangar. This is really bad, but we like making videos and doing fun stuff and flying airplanes, not cleaning. So let's get to the data. So the first bit of data we have is a static thrust test. Now don't get too hung up on these numbers because bottom line is this is just how hard the prop will pull at full power. How many pounds of thrust are you gonna get when the airplane is not moving? So for the first you know, 10 feet of your takeoff roll, this is a really important number. Beyond that, it becomes less important and things become very dynamic as airflow starts going through the prop. We're gonna look at a couple different things such as propeller weight, the static thrust. More importantly, what is the takeoff roll distance? What is the climb rate from 1,000 to 2,000 feet? How does it perform at top speed? All that good stuff. So for the static thrust numbers, uh, you can kind of see how we were doing this, but ultimately results here is our Sensenic 82 inch uh, carbon prop there pulling 392 pounds of thrust with the 70 inch warp drive that's got a few dings and dents in it pulling 397 pounds of thrust and the uh, E-Prop pulling 421 pounds of thrust. Um, and actually, uh, I think it was the Sensenic that actually broke the uh, the tie down strap uh, at one point. We had just a yeah, nice little Boy Scout square knot there, tied it back together. And uh, yeah, it seemed to work for a little while longer. But don't get too hung up on these numbers, all right? So yes, the E-Prop pulled the hardest. The E-Prop tended to uh, cavitate at those higher RPMs. You could actually hear a, a pretty nasty change in the sound. Um, but the E-Prop has something called ESR. That's one of the features of it. We'll talk a lot more about that later, where the warp drive and the sense nick are much, much more traditional propellers, where bottom line is you're gonna have a static RPM say like on your 172, this might be like 2300 RPM, as you take off and accelerate, now 25, 26, 2700 RPM. That's that's what you're used to seeing. On a, on a Rotax, we're gonna see something like 5500 for takeoff, maybe 5800 red line, uh, because it is a geared motor. But uh, with the E-Prop, it's a little weird. It actually uh, doesn't quite do that uh, normal stuff, whereas you accelerate, you see an increase in RPM, works a little differently. We'll talk about that here in a second. But next up, how much do these things weigh? Because, Although this doesn't seem significant, um, yeah, like 13 pounds on the warp drive, that's kind of heavy, and a lot of that weight's coming from the hub and uh, the attachment there. If you look at the Sensenic, it's lighter, coming in at 10 pounds, which is cool, taking three pounds off the nose of the airplane, that's that's really handy. For stole competitions, man, getting down to pretty much six pounds on this E-Prop, that is massive, going from 13 down to six. Um, that's a huge difference, being able to put more weight on the tail without actually adding weight to the tail for your stole competitions or for flying around the backcountry super light. Um, normally a heavy nose is not such a big deal because we don't fly our airplanes empty. We have a lot of weight in back and oftentimes flying in the backcountry, we're loading a lot of weight in back because we're, we're going hunting, fishing, camping, doing stuff. Um, but for competition purposes, man, if you can take the weight off that nose, that is huge. Uh, so that's where they came in weight-wise. Uh, the spinner on the E-Prop uh, just added about a pound if you do go ahead and throw that on there. And of course, that's a pound with the spinner and the uh, mounting hardware that was inside there. So now let's talk takeoff numbers. Obviously a very important number to us. When can we actually get the airplane off the ground for stole competitions and for everyday flying? How we did this is we taxied up the main gear alongside of a marker on the runway, had another marker exactly 200 feet down the runway, and then looking back at the video evidence, saw when the main gear broke free of the ground. That was considered our takeoff number. We left the tail wheel on the ground for all these takeoffs, which makes these takeoffs a little bit longer than they would be under real world conditions in the backcountry or at a stole competition, raising the tail and pulling it off with a flat simply just used half flap and left the tailwheel on the ground just to try to take all the pilot ability or lack thereof out of the equation to see exactly what the real numbers were going to be for both the Sensenic and the E-Prop. The warp drive we did not bother testing because we simply knew that, well, it just wasn't really giving us the takeoff numbers that we really want to, plus it wasn't totally fair considering the thing had, you know, four or five hundred hours on it and was a little chewed up and dented up at that point. So, bottom line, 
Running this three times for the Sensenik, we had a takeoff roll of 220, 210, 185. We had the EPROP takeoff roll of 210, 210, 190. So we did this as quickly as we could, as back to back as we could. Windsock wasn't moving the entire time, same day, roughly the same temperatures, just you know, maybe 10 minutes to actually swap the propeller, quick unbolt the Sensenik, get the EPROP bolted on there. And that gave us the, the most clear data we could possibly get as far as what is better on the takeoff roll? What is better on the takeoff roll? Okay, don't look at these numbers to, to, to really drive and buy a propeller from. Honestly, I'd like to hang on to both of these props because if I get into a no-win situation at a stole competition, that giant sense neck pushing so much air would be really handy to have. And if I have a good 15, 20 knot headwind that I'm playing around with, I think I'm gonna be running that E-prop because that ESR effect that they have on there really does seem to develop good thrust even at those higher speeds. You don't get that that wind-up effect of uh, going past red line like you might with the Sensenik, um, where when you pitch it super flat, it acts like a traditional propeller. Not that it's a bad prop by, by any means. I mean, I use it in the Soldovia Stoll competition, won the Soldovia Stoll competition with that. I think I had a takeoff somewhere in the 80-foot range. But our next test here really shows the difference between these two props, the ESR versus a standard prop like the Sensenik. So as we speed up here for a top speed test uh, to see, A, how fast will the airplane go, plus what's happening to the RPM, we can see, boy, that RPM on the Sensenik's is getting really high up there. Yes, it does make this airplane go fast, uh, you know, close to 120, that's pretty nice. Um, but when we swap over to the E prop, you can see, hey, look, the RPM is a little bit more manageable at wide open throttle. Again, we didn't change the pitch of these blades between the takeoff test and high speed test. So this is what you're gonna get for those takeoff numbers, what you're gonna get in cruise flight. Obviously you can always pitch for cruise or pitch for takeoff, but we're not trying to change things up here too much. So we just wanna see if we're pitching for good performance in a stole comp or for some backcountry flying, what kind of performance can we expect in cruise flight? And well, these were the numbers. So uh, the EPROP was pulling us along through the air a little bit higher speed, more importantly, at a slightly lower RPM so we weren't worried about over revving that engine. That's a really huge, nice safety margin there because you can see that sense Nick RPM gets up there quite high. So what am I using when I have to fly this airplane from Alaska down to Nevada here in a few weeks for Burning Man? Well, I'm going to be using the E-Prop for that because I do feel that there's slightly better efficiency to be had, most of all because the prop has simply less surface area. It has less wing area than, if you put it in terms of wings, less square footage of wing area on those skinny little blades than than that uh, Sensenik does. So there's going to be less frictional drag churning along for 30 some hours on down to Nevada. Lastly here though, let's go ahead and talk about climb rate. So we went ahead and got the airplane to a thousand feet MSL and then took it up to 2000 feet MSL, starting at the same indicated airspeed, just simply wide open throttle, wide open climb, trying to keep it right around a steady indicated airspeed of about 70 indicated, uh, making it as equal as possible. All this testing just for your information was done with um, some junk in the trunk, just that I didn't feel like cleaning out the airplane and full tanks. Uh, we did top off the airplane after swapping props, although doing all the testing in this little Rotax 912 uh, with you know one prop and then swapping to the other, probably only burned a gallon or two of gas, but we did go ahead and replace that gas just to have the most consistent CG and weight possible. For our rate of climb test, well, the prop came in at 49 seconds. The sense came in at 50 seconds. Now, that is well within the margin of error because pilot skill is involved here, keeping the ball in the center, maintaining the same airspeed, maintaining the same entry airspeed, all that good stuff, finishing airspeed. So bottom line is they seem to really climb the same uh, going from 1,000 MSL to 2,000 MSL. Now, before we go ahead and tell you which propeller you need to actually be buying, let's go ahead and look at how they hold up over a little bit of wear and tear during our testing phase here. So this is after about 20-ish hours of use to give you an idea of what it's gonna look like, how it holds up. The face of the blade, really not too bad. Um, obviously, dead bugs smeared on it, that sort of stuff. Some slightly deeper uh, little uh, nicks there. 82 inches, man, that is not a lot of clearance. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of ground clearance on this airplane. Uh, so it looked a little different when we got it. Um, certainly a little bit of wear there. This isn't deep stuff though. This isn't really affecting the blade too bad. As far as the nickel edge, um, it's perfectly intact as you would expect really. No, it's kind of hard to see. We'll try to focus on that there for you guys. Then as we look here, 
on this back side. So remember the back side of the blade is the face of the blade. That's where you're gonna get your big nicks and stuff. Uh, but typically just into paint, you know, so this is a little rougher. So, I mean, yeah, you can definitely catch your fingernail on this stuff, but it's just paint, it's not, not a big deal. It's not through the nickel or anything like that. Um, did it look like this when we got it? No, it was brand new. Um, 20 hours, is that bad? Eh, it's not great, but really, again, it's a ground clearance issue. It's nothing to do with the propeller. Here, this one's gonna be, um, oh, sitting around, I think about six, 700 hours on it, maybe about four or 500 hours in Alaska. You can see we're above the nickel, it's getting some wear. I would expect to see that on, on any of these over time. I mean, this is probably from landing on a volcano with uh, volcanic rock, you know, taxing uphill with a tailwind or something and just sucking up all sorts of dirt and nastiness. Um, these little wowies in here, this is a little bit worse because that's going to be, it's not through the nickel, but it's deep enough that it's hitting the carbon and affecting the structure of the blade. That's part of why we were taking this one off. We've got another one of those over on one of these other blades here. And so, uh, let's see. Nice one right there at the tip. Now, as far as the face of the blade goes, it's wore down so much that you can actually see the carbon in there. Uh, it's just sandblasted is what it is. I mean, all the blades look like that. That is what you're gonna get uh, flying off airport, probably with any of this stuff. I mean, I don't think that that's, uh, I mean, paint is not, uh, it's a sacrificial layer, right? So lather on some more paint, it'll last a little longer. Now, keep in mind, that's a 70 inch prop. This is 82 inches, so you're trading quite a bit there. Um, you know, they're six inches close to the ground. It's pretty uh, pretty significant. Now, how's our E-props holding up? And this is probably 20, 30 hours on these blades now. So let's take a look here. Actually, it looks really good. Obviously, these are clear coated, so of course you can see the carbon from the get-go. Um, We've, it does come with sleeves to put on this. You would not want to park this thing out on the ramp in the sun uh, for any real length of time, you know, for, for months or anything like that. That would really start to affect the carbon being that it's not painted. The clear coat does offer some uh, protection. And just because, it, say, if it was painted, it wouldn't be all that much better. If you're going to paint it any color, you'd paint it white. Um, if you want to get an idea of the play here in the blades, this is thin and light which, I mean, that's that's the idea. It works that way for that ESR effect. Um, as far as the face goes, um, dead bugs, no big dings. Um, so nothing uh, too crazy there. Um, as far as, um, you know, adjustability or trimming, I think these ones are gonna be pretty easy to trim and adjust the uh, diameter if you wanted to. I think you could probably do that with the Sensenic ones, but maybe not as easily. And then, of course, your warp drive. Um, I don't think that's too difficult at all to do it on there um, to trim those guys. I know people have certainly done plenty of that before. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what you're seeing after after some wear and tear, after some actual use. Um, nothing big here. Let's see if there's any that I can find. Uh, most of this is... Most of the roughness I'm feeling is more so dead bugs um, than actual uh, big chunks missing. So pretty good news there for our uh, E-Props blade as well. Boy, that's got some give to it. Hey, at least when you walk into it in the hangar, it's not going to hurt quite as bad. But boy, these are thin and sharp. Um, and well, same, same with a lot of propellers. God, that is a mess. Man, comment below if you want to come give me a hand and organize this thing this winter. Yuck. So at the end of the day, which prop do you need to buy for your airplane? Well, it just depends on what your mission is. They're both really good propellers. Is the warp drive even a good prop? Sure, it held up for a long time. It's fairly inexpensive. It's the cheapest of all three. The Sensenic and the E-Prop are very similarly priced. I don't think you'll be disappointed with either one, but it is pretty mission specific as everything is in aviation. That's always a compromise. So decide what your mission is, what you're going to be doing most often, stole competitions, everyday flying, trying to fly efficiently, trying to, you know, do whatever it is. Decide what that mission is, then hopefully the data here in this video gives you the information you need to be able to choose the right propeller for you. I'd love to hear in the comments below what you guys think of these two specific props, the Sensenic and the E-Prop, if you have any experience with them, or if you have experience with other brands of propellers that you guys think we should test out in future videos. And just 
what's been your experience overall if you have actually had the experience with your aircraft changing propellers and seeing how that changes the effect uh, basically on cruise, climb, takeoff, landing, even all that good stuff. I will say that Sensenik, man, that is a great air break for those stole competitions uh, compared to the other props that just had simply smaller surface area. Um, but it's also a little heavier than some of the other stuff out there on the market. It's, it's all a trade-off, but all good stuff. Leave in the comments below what you guys think. Would love to hear it. Make sure you like the video. If you did not already, greatly would appreciate that. It helps us a ton. And if you find this information helpful, then please do like it. And consider subscribing right over there if you guys want to see more videos like this, more updates on our airplane house builds that we're doing here in Alaska, more updates on flight training videos as we release them, just updating some old stuff, showing you some new stuff, some new techniques, some new tips, some new tricks, and some new cool places to fly here in Alaska. As always, guys, if you cannot fly every day, Flymikeelf.com. We'll see y'all in the next one.